Today is February 8, 2016. My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing Robert E. Hayes, resident bishop of the Oklahoma area, the United Methodist Church. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Bishop Hayes, appreciate you taking time from your busy schedule to, to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Let's, first of all, let's find out some things about you. Can you share some personal information in your family, where you grew up, um, early events in your life that influenced your spiritual formation? Yes, uh, I was born in Houston, Texas, and I am the son and grandson of United Methodist Ministers. My grandfather started preaching in 1901 in East Texas, and my father took up uh, after him and became a pastor uh, in the uh, Houston area, and I grew up in Houston. Um, I'm one of four children, the only son, and so, uh, but early on in my life, watching my dad uh, do his ministry had a great influence on me. As a matter of fact, I remember being four or five years old when church was out on Sunday mornings. I would go and grab a chair and pull it up to the pulpit because I couldn't see over it. And I would bang my hand on the pulpit like my dad did, you know, and to this imaginary audience that was there, you know. But uh, I remember those days very well. And uh, nine, ten years old, I was conducting funeral services for birds, cats, anything in the neighborhood that died. So uh, I, my life has been in the Methodist Church. I mean, it's in my DNA, and uh, it's always been a part of uh, who I was and, and what I, where I was going. And I think about the age of 13, uh, I gave my life to Christ. Didn't really know what it meant, but it happened at a church camp, and they asked and invited folks who wanted to give their lives to Christ uh, to step up around this, this glowing cross uh, uh, in Galveston, Texas. And so I stepped up, and from that point on, uh, uh, it has all been with the Methodist Church. Everything I've done has been a part of ministry. When, when did you first receive your call to the ministry? About that time, but I, I became a what we call a local pastor when I was about 15 years old. Back in those days, uh, you, you get voted by your congregation and, and you can become a local pastor. And I think I gave my first sermon around 14, 15 years old. It was horrible, but anyway, I gave that first sermon. And so that uh, between 13 and 16, was, I was wrestling with what it meant to want to go into ministry. And by the time I got to high school, uh, I had clarified it and, and knew that that's what I wanted to do. Could you talk a little bit about your educational background and seminary training? Sure. I, um, I finished public schools in Houston, and I went to a United Methodist-related institution in Austin, Texas. It was called Houston Tillotson College at that time. It's Houston Tillotson University now. And uh, I've got my uh, BA degree um, from uh, Houston Tillotson in Austin. And from there, I went to Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. Uh, and uh, got my uh, uh, Master's of Theology there. And from there, several years later, I went to Drew University, another Methodist, United Methodist Institution in Madison, New Jersey, and received my Doctorate of Ministry there. So all my education has been in the United Methodist Church, within United Methodist Institutions. And uh, I've been given a Doctor of Divinity degree from Oklahoma City University. And so my educational background has all been at, with the Methodist Church. And can you kind of briefly review some of your appointments uh, that you had at the church and the leadership positions that you've held? Okay. Uh, while I was at Perkins, we had this deal where you could go to seminary on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, and then on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, uh, you, you went out and you preached at a, at a congregation. It was student appointment. My first student appointment uh, was around 1971 in a little town in East Texas called Longview, Texas. Had no idea where Longview, Texas was at that time. And I would drive out from Dallas on weekends uh, to go and preach at this little church, McCabe United Methodist Church. And uh, as fate would have it, my dad was appointed as president of Wiley College 20 miles away from there. So uh, I would go to Longview and preach and then go over to Wiley and, and uh, uh, eat dinner Sunday afternoon with my dad before going back to seminary. And my dad saw the plight I was in at a little church. They weren't paying much, you know, $70 a week. 
So he hired me as uh, the college chaplain to conduct the uh, religious ceremonies uh, and, and services on Wiley's campus. And so as a young pastor, college chaplain, I moved from there back to Houston, Texas and received a, a charge, Blue Ridge United Methodist Church. Stayed there for 11 years and we built a new church and, and from there to Riverside United Methodist Church. Um, and so the local church uh, has, has been a part of my life for 25 years. And then in 1994, I was moved into the administrative part, became a district superintendent in Houston for uh, nearly eight years, and then the conference treasurer for three years, and I was elected a bishop out of that position in 2004. Did you ever intend to be in administration? No, I didn't. I enjoyed the local church. As a matter of fact, my, my tenures in, in the local church have been long. Usually a student appointment is about two years at maximum. I stayed five years. They, they bought a little parsonage for me and when I completed seminary, you know, for $13,000 in 1971 and stayed there for five years. And then when I went back to Houston, I stayed at that first church 11 years and then nine or 10 years. No, administration was never in my uh, mirror. Uh, I was just in love with what I did in the local church, pastoring, preaching, those kinds of things. Can you share some information with us about your election to, to the Episcopacy of the United Methodist Church, your appointment, and in, in this case, your reappointment? Yes, uh, I, you know, the Episcopacy was never in my mind uh, as something that I wanted to do. I, I just had no idea or clue that that was what God had in store for me. Um, it was in 2000, I think it was, that I led a legislative committee at General Conference and um, it was a pretty difficult legislative committee. And that sort of put my name on the radar for, for folks. And, uh, and in 2000, I was, uh, my name was offered as a uh, Episcopal leader, as a bishop in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, as fate would have it, it was not meant to be at that time. And in 2004, I was elected in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was the uh, first of four bishops elected there. Uh, I was elected on the third ballot. Being a bishop was something far beyond my, my imagination, but I, I embraced it and uh, I tried to do this job as I would have um, the, the ministry, the pastorate, is caring, relational, and all about people. And so that's, that's what this job entails for me. You serve actually again. The dual responsibilities as bishop of the Oklahoma Conference and the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Is that unusual for bishops to serve? No, it's not unusual. As a matter of fact, bishops uh, predominantly have served two conferences throughout our history. If you look at just this jurisdiction, Arkansas used to be two conferences, north and south. Missouri used to be east and west. Kansas, likewise, east and west. Uh, even now, we have uh, bishops in this jurisdiction who serve two comp conferences. Uh, Bishop Bledsoe in New Mexico also serves Northwest Texas. Uh, just recently, before Rio Grande merged with the Southwest Texas Conference, uh, there were two conferences there. So there's been a history of two conferences in our area for quite some time. As a matter of fact, Oklahoma used to be three conferences, East and West, and Bishop Angie Smith had New Mexico as well. So it's been a, a, a checkered history of two conferences quite often. Another point that might ask you about being unusual, you were reappointed to the same area of assignment. Is it, don't the Norman move a bishop after one? Uh, yes, yes they do. They, uh, they usually move a bishop after eight years. Um, eight years is probably the maximum that most bishops will stay, but my, my tenure was 12 years. And there were several of us in this jurisdiction who uh, had 12 years left. And what the Jurisdictional Episcopacy Committee decided was, was that tenure was more important than movement. And so I would have had four years left somewhere else if I had moved after eight years. And so my being here 12 years was more important, and I agree with them because it takes you a while to kind of get up and, and, and understand, the, get things rolling. And so if I had left here in, in, in after eight years and spent only four years in the next conference, it, I would not have known that conference well. So 
uh, me and, and two or three other bishops were allowed to spend 12 years, and we call it missional purposes, uh, for the mission of the church. Uh, that's more important than just movement. So uh, it, it's been unusual recently, but we're understanding that length of time in a particular place really uh, brings dividends. Oklahoma was was gracious to receive me for another four years. Well, a question: You you serve, of course, in one of the two uh, conferences, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Is it uh, is it the only uh, remaining uh, Native American conference in, in the United States? It's the only distinctive uh, missionary missionary conference of its kind that's left. There used to be several what we called missionary conferences, Red Bird in the Kentucky area, Alaska used to be a missionary conference, Rio Grande, all those missionary conferences now have either merged into other conferences or uh, been done away with. Uh, Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference really is the only missionary conference currently in existence. How, how different is the Challenges and I'm saying the opportunities that you have in the uh, OIMC. Uniquely, the uniquely challenging. As a matter of fact, uh, when I first got here, I didn't know what to expect uh, uh, being a part of, of both conferences, and I, I quickly came to learn that there are some distinct differences. First of all, the size is, is different, it's much smaller than the Oklahoma Annual Conference. Uh, there are only about 90 churches in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Uh, the, the size of the membership is small. We have about 8,000 members compared to 220,000 in the Oklahoma Conference. We're scattered about. Um, we have churches uh, in Dallas. We have a church in Dallas. We have churches in Kansas City, uh, uh, Kansas, and Missouri. Uh, we have churches throughout Kansas. So we're sort of scattered about. But yes, there are unique and distinctive challenges um, that, that come with that. Um, we, we have uh, uh, the challenge of leadership and, and finances and growth and, and all those other things, but uniquely different. Can, can you mention some key initiatives and highlights of the OIMC during your tenure as, as bishop? Well, when I first got here in 2004, one of the uh, initiatives that I wanted to do was was to bring a new spirit to the place. Now you can't write that down on paper what that looks like, but it's the it's it's the feeling that we that we are not a second class conference, that we have a purpose and a destiny and that we belong. And so generating that spirit within the conference itself was the first thing that I wanted to do was to bring that new spirit in here that says we are indeed somebody. And then to capitalize on that, what I wanted to do was to make the visibility of OIMC uh, plain and clear. A lot of people don't know anything about what a missionary conference is or Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, have no clue as to what it's all about. And so increasing the visibility of OIMC was another initiative that I wanted to, to just let people know that not only uh, were we here, but in fact, to, to build upon the history of that, Oklahoma Indians brought Methodism to Oklahoma uh, from the Trail of Tears. And, and how many people in Oklahoma knew that Methodism, the seeds of Methodism, were planted by Native Americans here in Oklahoma? And so just sharing that history, uh, making us visible, uh, creating a new spirit uh, within the conference was my first initiative. And then from there, it built to more serious and substantive things like uh, addressing the inequities of pay, uh, you know, and salary. Uh, then talking about the educational opportunities. Those are the kinds of things. And what I've done to those, for those initiatives is create an endowment in which we will uh, build up the reserve so that the interest can go toward increasing the salary of our pastors who really operate at poverty level. And then tr trying to increase the opportunities for education so that our pastors can get an education practically free of charge. And so there are several other things that we try to do, but it's just changing the whole culture 
and the way we look at ourselves and, and who we are uh, and what we do as a conference. Well, at least the follow-up question, what's in the name? Okay. Uh, I've wondered, in 1968, for example, the Indian Mission Conference was changed to Oklahoma Indian Missionary uh -huh. Conference. Can you, there's, there's some subtle differences there. Not? You know what? I, I, it's hard for me to put uh, put my mind uh, where they were in 1968 when they changed it or when they adopted the resolution to make it an Indian Missionary Conference. But just in my own mind, I, you know, we, we, we know what a mission is. A mission is something that you go to, something that you bring help for. I think it, in 1968, the Methodist Church realized with the unification and all of that, is that the Oklahoma Indian uh, population was not a mission, it's not something that we go and do something for, but rather to understand that they can bring us something rather than us giving them something. They can bring a unique perspective of Methodism. And, and so I think uh, uh, the Indian Missionary Conference concept came about uh, to, to really uh, mold and shape this new entity of Native Americans within the church. 1968 was a pivotal year in the history of the church. Not only did we merge in Dallas with the EUB, we did away with the central conference, uh, a central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, which was the all black part of which I grew up in. And uh, I think it was a, an important year that we came to realize that people of color, people of uh, native ancestry, they had something to bring to the table. And so we, we, uh, we received that and, and we accepted the fact that here were people who had a mission and a purpose as well and who could give us something uh, in place of us trying to give them something. So I think we came into our own in that year, even though it's, it's still a struggle. Unfortunately, Bishop Hayes, uh, historically, the relationships between the Methodist churches and Native American communities uh, have been often con uh, contentious and, div and divisive. And the missionary efforts of the Methodist church have often included injustices to the Native uh, peoples that inflicted physical violence and cultural trauma. Uh, can you provide a historical perspective on the reasons for this uh, tenuous relationship and cite past actions of the church that have caused this harm? Yes, I can speak to the harm and the injustices that have been uh, perpetrated upon Native Americans uh, in our history, not only within the church, but also within uh, the national uh, governments and things of that nature. I believe that the divisiveness and the contentious relationship between the Native American community and uh, the other entities of government and church um, have been created because uh, of a lack of trust and broken promises and, and things of that nature that have really reaped harm to, to those communities, uh, Native American communities. When you stop and you think about the fact that uh, in the 1830 Act of Removal uh, signed by Andrew Jackson, people from Georgia and Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama were forced to move, to, to vacate their lands uh, and to be relocated, which became known as the Trail of Tears. They actually took the land and, and moved folks to uh, places that they've never been before. And when you stop and you think about why, you, you look at those states as being states where they grew cotton and sugar cane and it was all for economic greed that people were displaced. Thousands of people died along the trail uh, uh, being relocated. And when you stop and you think about even further the fact that when they got to where they were relocated, uh, as early as 1889, they decided to, well, let's take that again. And, uh, and so uh, it's a series of broken promises and treaties that were signed. Uh, and, and people don't have a clue as to the history of how Native Americans got to where they are today, what was taken from them, and that traumatizes. You know, it's been a hundred now, 185 years uh, or more since the act of removal was signed. And the effects of that are still being played out today in, in the Native American community when you, when you look at the economic uh, uh, impact that it's had, where, where Native Americans are the poorest 
of, uh, of poor in our state and, and basically in our nation. When you look at the educational limitations that Native Americans have, when you look at the health and, and, and the situation that Native Americans find themselves in, it continues to perpetuate itself nearly 190 years afterward. And so uh, these series of broken treaties and promises have done harm and, and created a great ill effect within the psyche of Native American community. And the church is, 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 uh, is also to blame as well because the church has had its share and it's, and it's done its harm as well. Irreparable damage has been done by the church because we saw this as a problem. As a matter of fact, if you go back to George Washington, he claimed that a, 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 an Indian problem, a native problem, and his solution was, was to civilize Native Americans and try to make them like the dominant culture. And which is why you get your know, five civilized tribes. That's, you know, these tribes, we, we're gonna make them like us. And, and that, that was uh, uh, terrible for, for the Native American community. And then when you talk about Andrew Jackson and Van Buren, all those presidents, all those presidents were complicit in, in, in breaking down and, and tearing apart the Native American community through treaties and acts and just outright taking the land. You know, we are quick to condemn colonialization uh, back in, you know, back in the time of France and England and Bill, but we have our own history of colonization here in America and it's, it's, uh, it's a bad history. Within the, the uh, church, the United Methodist Church were different uh, formations of the church at that time. Can you speak to some of the things the church did specifically, uh, mission, boarding schools, uh, denial of their native uh, spirituality, some of those things? Yes, I have read a lot of books about the Native American community being denied their rights or civil rights or, or their, uh, their autonomy as, as native people, uh, boarding schools and, and other uh, circumstances where you would be taken away. Families were actually separated and taken apart. Children were shipped off to boarding school hundreds of miles away from where they live, uh, unable to communicate with parents or family, uh, told that they couldn't speak their language. As a matter of fact, uh, in reading some of the history, they were actually beaten because uh, if they spoke their language, they, they were actually physically beaten or or uh, put in solitary confinement. Uh, and, and so it was all in an effort to, to change the culture and make Native Americans like the dominant culture. And, and it was never meant to be that way. Rather than accepting them as who they were, we tried to change them into what we wanted them to be. And so that, that whole history is just checkered with, with all kinds of acts of, of violence and insensitivity to, to who Native Americans were actually uh, the kind of persons that they really were. And, and, we, and, and most Americans, even to this day, have no clue that some of these inequities and, and injustices were perpetuated upon the Native American community. And that's why the struggle has been so hard. And if I understand, you say it's really two parts of what the church has done and then, then what the church hasn't done is complicity in, in not speaking out against some of these things. Yes, indeed. We have, we have our share. The church has our share of, of its problems as well as it relates to the Native American community. The church uh, is guilty, first of all, of not acknowledging the sins of the, of the past. We were silent uh, during a, a, a very difficult time. You don't see the church standing up and acknowledging is wrong. Only recently have we come to grips that there's a violent history that the church has been in, involved with. For instance, Sand Creek was, was led by a, a Methodist preacher and uh, we were not taught that in our history books. You know, we were not taught that the church was complicit in these atrocities. These are just the ones we know. Uh, you know there, there's no telling how many we don't know about, but the church has had its its share of trying to form and, and do away with Native American practices only to, to, to bring them into a religion that says, okay, 
uh, if we're going to try to civilize you, you have to worship like we do, and you have to conform to things like we do. So the church has had this, it mirrors exactly what went on in our nation uh, in, a, in a spiritual, religious way, if you can, if you can believe that. If I could add on one more question, that is, in your opinion, uh, the, the Western theology that, that's so strong and the doctrine that we have that all the churches are like, did that work against us in working with the Native American communities in the sense we wanted to be just like us? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Uh, the Wesleyan theology and the Wesleyan movement was always pro-rights for folks. I mean, it was one of the first organizations that was anti-slavery, and 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 that was hard for for folks to 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 to, to understand. But you're right. When we try to change folks with instead of respecting, you know, their practices and principles. Uh, we, we try to ingrain them into our way of, of doing worship. And consequently, when you try to do that, you do away with those things that, that made Native Americans uniquely who they were. Uh, for instance, when I got to Oklahoma, one of the first things that I was introduced to was a cedar burning ceremony in which an elder of the tribe would purify me with the burning of cedar over coals, cedar wood over coals. And so I was invited to Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, in the first Native American church there, I stood over these coals, and the, and the elder of the tribe with his feathers would put the cedar on the coal and the smoke would rise, and he would purify me with the, with the feathers of an eagle, and, and the smoke would be all over me, and he would purify each part of my body. Now, some churches would consider that to be uh, an unforgivable thing, you know, if, if we tried to do that in a, in, a, in a church. But to say to them, you cannot do that, you, cannot, you can no longer practice this, it's, it's not fair, it's, it's an injustice. And so there, that's just one of the ceremonies that Native Americans have done and, and continue to do that I think uh, need to be honored and respected. But in our way of thinking, it goes against the grain of, of what we think would be uh, acceptable within our churches. So yes, I think it's done a lot of harm that we have chosen to eliminate instead of include a lot of what they do. Bishop Hayes, recently the United Methodist Church has reached out to the Native American community to reconcile relations and heal the wounds of the past. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, speak to a little bit, first of all, if I can make this distinction, I'll call it the empowerment movement of the 60s, 70s, and 80s before mm -hmm. the reconciliation movement. Mm -hmm. What were some of the steps that the church was taking at the time? To move towards, uh, I believe that the church recognized that we have a problem with uh, indigenous people and uh, ethnic groups. I think the church realized this. It was ongoing uh, as early as the 1939 General Conference when we decided to bring back the North and the South Episcopal Church. When we brought that back, it was in Kansas City that they had, the, there was a contingent of African Americans, blacks who were in the audience. My former bishop, Willis J. King, when I was a kid, was in that audience and he begged the General Conference not to segregate the central jurisdiction. Well, they created it. I think it's been a long time, since 1844, when the whole Methodist church uh, uh, fell apart because of slavery, we've always had issues of race and ethnicity and, and problems with trying to come to grips with it. And I believe the church has really wanted to try to find solutions, just as the nation has, as to how do we empower. So. I was a product of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and early 60s. I watched people march. I watched my dad get arrested at a lunch counter in Houston, Texas. I watched that. And so the church has, has wrestled with these issues. And I think, as I said earlier, 68 was a pivotal year. I believe we began to, to understand that we had a role to play in the empowering, in, in the uh, fostering of better relationships, not only with African Americans, but Hispanics, Native Americans. If we're going to truly be a united Methodist church, well then we have to begin to think in unity. 
And so I believe that was the, the basis, the beginning of, of our consciousness saying to us, we've got to find a better way. And so it, it has led to this, this, these whole acts of reconciliation. Um, the, the Native American act of repentance was not the first. In 2000, in Cleveland, Ohio, there was a reconciliation service for African Americans because I come from the historical perspective where there were African Americans who actually stayed in the balcony when Richard Allen took the contingent out of former slaves and created the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There were, there were slaves, or former slaves, who stayed in the balcony who did not go with Richard Allen. Those were my ancestors. Those are the ones who, who brought Methodism to African Americans and on down the line. So it's not anything new, but I think we're coming to grips with the fact that we have an obligation to understand, to reach out, to empower, and to enable uh, other communities, indigenous folks and ethnic groups, to understand that they don't have to be like us in order to be spiritual. Two-part question about the reconciliation movement. First, can you share some steps taken by the church to empower its constituencies? You sort of spoke to that a little bit. But can you explain the purpose of the acts of repentance? Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions that I, that I hear. And yes. Can you share uh, that movement, kind of where it came out of, and, and what its purpose was and goal was? The act of repentance movement for Native Americans came out of the 2008 General Conference in Fort Worth. As a matter of fact, in the Book of Resolutions, uh, there, there's a statement there. First of all, it's ironic that the page before the act of repentance, uh, there's the apology. The apology of, of all of the atrocities and all of our involvement in those acts to the Native American community. We, in the 2008 Book of Resolution, we actually say we, we are very sorry that we were complicit in these acts. And then you look at the next page and then it talks about, well, this is 2008. In 2012, the United Methodist Church should do an act of repentance to the Native American and indigenous community. So it goes back a ways, it goes back nearly eight years now that we've been thinking about this. And in Tampa, uh, the actual act of repentance was initiated. It was, it was done so to draw uh, the awareness uh, of uh, our United Methodist structure to those inequities, uh, to talk about the fact that Native Americans were a unique part of our denomination and that there were a lot of things that were done that we are very not only sorry for, but let's see if we can do better. And so the bishops issued a letter saying that we will observe the act of repentance and it would go on for four years from 2012 to 2016 in every conference celebrating the fact that we move beyond uh, those, those, hard, those hard things that we did to something better, uh, a, a harmonious relationship, if you could call it that. Can you, uh, what's the, in your opinion, what's the, the hoped or anticipated outcome of, of the repentance movement? Well, my hope for the act of repentance, the outcome for it is really twofold. Uh, my hope is, is that we don't just do this and then neatly put it in a box and put it away for forever. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, it ought to provide an opportunity, open some doors of opportunity for us to get to know one another, to educate and inform people about Native American life and Native American community within the United Methodist Church and beyond. I, I hope that this act of repentance really signals a turnaround where we don't just say those are the people who live over there. No, those are our neighbors and we need to get to know our neighbors. I hope that we can begin uh, talking about the truth uh, as it relates to the Native American community. In South Africa, when apartheid was ended, they had what they called the truth and reconciliation trials and movement. We can reconcile and we can, we can do all kinds of acts of repentance, 
But unless you couple it with the truth of what has actually happened to our Native American community, unless you put all those things on the table and acknowledge and, and truthfully say we're sorry, and then, then you begin to repent and then you begin to reconcile. It's, it's a movement. It's not a one and done kind of thing where we do this, okay, we've, we've paid our uh, respects and we've, we've said we were sorry, now let's go back to living the way we used to. That would be horrible. And, and, and my, my hope is, is that this is the beginning, the beginning of truth telling, the beginning of true repentance to, to show, you know, that we're sorry. Native Americans are very distrustful of, of treaties and truths and, and things like that, that we say we're going to do this. You know, what they want to see is the result, the action of it. And I hope that this repentance really does turn into reconciliation and our actions actually speak louder than our words. that have questioned the need for repentance, uh, asserting that it's too late, quoting for an apology. Uh, there's no need for, you know, it's too late, there's no need to apologize. What, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I've, I've often heard that mirrored in my own life too, you know, when we talk about slavery and those other things in our history and people say, I, w I wasn't there, you know, uh, I, I didn't do anything, you know. Well, what I would say to people who say to me that they don't think that we need an act of repentance because the, the history is long and gone. Um, how can you say that we don't need an act of repentance when the results, the effects of what happened 180 years ago are still being played out every day on the streets in our communities and in our cities, especially here in Oklahoma? When you talk about uh, crime, when you talk about poverty, when you talk about health, when you talk about education, usually the Native American community is either at the bottom of the list where it should be at the top or at the top of the list where it should be at the bottom. For instance, when you talk about alcoholism or health and obesity issues, Native American community is at the top. When you talk about health issues and education and those things that should be important, they're usually at the bottom. We are still, we, we've not come to grips with the fact that we're still feeling that effect. If I, if I just took everything away from you right now and gave you nothing, which is that in effect what happened, they took our land, they took our culture, they left us nothing, and then they came and took nothing, you know, as in the case of Oklahoma, took nothing from us. So what does that leave us? So you have to build a whole culture, a whole civilization from the ground up again. So I don't buy the argument that it's no longer necessary or needed. Act of repentance is no longer necessary or needed. We've, we've had a, a, a very complicit part of the outcome of the eventual culture, what it has become. And we need to look at that every day. And we need to repent of that. We need to do things that encourage empowerment and, and upward mobility. And, and that's what we don't do. Picking up on some of your earlier conversations about it's not a one and done kind of thing. Yes. Uh, in 2012, we talked about the, uh, with the act of the repentance. Yes. The general conference then in 2014, uh, the bishops, the council of bishops then had the here in Oklahoma City. Yes. Uh, and then I noticed that coming up this year in our annual the Oklahoma annual conference, we're having the uh, act of repentance. Is this try to get it more to the grassroots level? Or? Yes. This is this is something that I'm I'm uh, I don't want to say proud of, but I'm I'm delighted that it has come about. The council of bishops uh, took the lead from the 2012 general conference. And, and acted upon the fact that if leadership or is going to come from the church, it should start at the bishops. So in 2014, we actually, in our meeting at Lake Junaluska, North Carolina, 
we symbolically went to Cherokee, North Carolina, one of the beginnings of the Trail of Tears, and we worshiped there with that Native American community. We went to the place where the trail began, and, and we worshiped there with, with the Cherokees and the other tribes of that community. And, and then uh, when the Council of Bishops came to Oklahoma, it was another symbolic act that we came to the ending place of where the trail actually had its conclusion. The Council of Bishops got involved in this because they understand a little bit full, more fuller now the plight that Native Americans are in. They were able to witness for themselves the most vibrant Native American community or conference in our denomination. They were actually to, here to partake of that. They went out to immersion trips and things of that nature. And as it relates to the annual conference of Oklahoma, I think that our conference should set the standard for what act of repentance and reconciliation looks like. So we've done it for three years now. Beginning the first year, it was education and information. The second year, we actually sent the delegates out to the Native churches in these communities. We have six Native American churches in the greater Oklahoma City. We actually sent them out to have lunch and to hear the stories of the Native American community. And so in this coming year of the uh, annual conference, we will have Ray Buckley, who uh, is one of the most prominent Native American uh, uh, speakers, to come and address our conference. A litany will be done, a litany of reconciliation. We are moving now from repentance to reconciling, and I believe that that's a natural progression. So we are, we are past now the fact that we not only acknowledge, but we, we want to share the truth of what I was saying a moment ago. And we want to truly reconcile each other to one another. And so Oklahoma has done a three-year progression. And before I leave here as bishop, I'm going to throw down the gauntlet and say these three years should be the beginning of the rest of our journey together because we have to live together. Bishop Hayes, can you speak to your role in this? I know you've had a leadership role with the Council of Bishops. Can you talk a little bit? You've probably got some good inside information. Well, I've, I've been privileged to work with the Council of Bishops on the act of repentance and, and uh, uh, with the indigenous community. I have been privileged to work with Shabam Colonel from the General Board of Global Ministries, with Anita Phillips from the Native American Comprehensive Plan. Uh, I am the, the uh, Episcopal uh, representative to the Native American Episcopal uh, Native American Comprehensive Plan. Wherever they meet, I'm there because I want to hear what's going on there. Uh, I've I've tried to use my role as bishop, as a conduit, as, as a person, uh, and in a go between between me and the Council of Bishops. Anything that I can do that improves the visibility the spiritual well-being of the Native American community, I plan to do that, not only when I'm active, but when I am retired as well. I have already made commitments to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference uh, that I will be engaged and involved in furthering the work of this annual conference. And uh, as a bishop, I have tried to use everything within my ability to promote and enhance the welfare not only of this act of repentance, but of Native Americans in general. You mentioned the, uh, the, the Native American uh, uh, Comprehensive Plan. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, the plan, what elements are in that plan? Sure. The Native American Comprehensive Plan was birthed by a general conference. You'd have to go back some years, but the general conference birthed the Native American Comprehensive Plan. Uh, just as we were coming to grips in 1968 with the, the whole problems of ethnicity and, and culture, we decided that what we would do was to create different plans that would speak directly to the need of that particular group. For instance, with African Americans, it's strengthening the black church, uh, uh, you know, for SBC 21 uh, for the 21st century. With Native Americans, it became the Native American Comprehensive Plan. It is to resource, 
It is to support and it is to advocate on behalf of Native Americans to the United Methodist Church. It speaks to the need for us to be in leadership roles and leadership positions. It speaks to the need for us to develop safe places of worship and opportunity for Native Americans. It speaks to the need for us to, uh, to support Native American communities wherever they are. You have a lot of Native American churches that are part of annual conferences all over the United States. Uh, in the Northeast, in the, in, in the Southeast, uh, at, in the West. There are Native American congregations all over the United States. And you have to have a voice that speaks on their behalf. Many of them are in conferences that probably don't even know there's a Native American church in that conference. So where are they to have a voice or where are they to be present at the table where decisions are being made. So the Native American Comprehensive Plan is a tool that is being used by uh, the general church and by Native Americans to support, advocate, and, and to enhance the presence of Native Americans within the United Methodist Church. Reconciliation movement, particularly in the, uh, uh, the uh, Acts of Repentance, mm -hmm. doing the, at the uh, conference level. Are there other uh, plans to take it to the local church level? Uh, do you know what the plan is for, for, for uh, rolling that out? The hope is that the Act of Repentance will filter its way into every local church in the denomination, in the United Methodist Church. There will be many who will say, we, we don't have a Native American community where we live, you know, why, why should it come to us? Well, it should come to you as a form of education, as a form of letting you know that there are Native Americans present in this great denomination of ours and to be uh, culturally aware that, that, that they are there. As a matter of fact, probably the only or the closest place that most congregations come to Native American uh, ministry is the Native American Sunday. We have a, a, one of the official offering Sundays is called Native American you know, Sunday. And so we get people out from the church and we have them go and speak to congregations and, and we take up money for scholarships and things of that nature. But the United Methodist Church should be aware that uh, a good percentage of, of Native Americans are United Methodist, and, and we have an obligation to make sure that uh, their voices are heard. They, they are at the table. Uh, we've never had a, a Native American bishop. As a matter of fact, it's ironic that we're going back to Portland, Oregon for the General Conference of 2016, where 40 years ago in 1976, was the first place that Native Americans could vote at a general conference. Uh, so we're, we're going back to the scene of the crime, so to speak, where, where we were just given the right to vote 40 years ago. And so uh, even though you know, the local church should be uniquely involved, that's the arena. That's where we want this act of repentance to, to, to end up because you may not have any Native Americans in your community, but that does not exclude you from knowing or learning about the plight of Native Americans within our church and within our culture. As Bishop of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, uh, you have a unique perspective uh, and informed understanding of the histor uh, historical role and importance of the mission ministry of Native American Methodism. What, uh, is, is, uh, can you discuss the current status of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference? Yes. The current status of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, I like to think is vibrant, rele relevant, uh, and exclusively speaking to the needs of Native American people. As a matter of fact, the purpose that is stated in our Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference brochures and all is to take the life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, particularly to the Native American community. In Oklahoma, we are the second largest group 
in, of, of, of folks in Oklahoma. Uh, we represent about 9% of the population, more than African Americans, you know, and we rank second in the nation of Native American population, second only to California. So we have roughly 10% of the population of Oklahoma is Native American. And of that 10%, I can only imagine how many are, are not in a church or have heard the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. So our purpose, our mission is clear. We have to do a better job of reaching the Native American community. And I like to think that the Native uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference is doing that. We are present in Kansas. We have five churches in Kansas alone. Uh, our largest church is in Dallas, Texas, where I spoke last weekend. We had 150 people in, in, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, people don't think we got a Native American community in Dallas, but one of the larger communities is in Dallas, Texas. And so when you stop and you think about the fact that we are a sizable population. We, we have a purpose, we have a mission. Uh, and so the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference is, is doing well. We are starting new churches and new fellowships. We are concentrating on bringing more uh, young people into uh, leadership roles in the church. So I like to think that the state of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, although is good, I would hope that it can even get greater. It can get to great. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great conference, but we, we still struggle with a lot of challenges. How has the Oklahoma Conference helped uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference uh, in terms of mission and ministry to its members? The Oklahoma Conference has helped the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that we try to help, we are the second largest contributor of funds to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Uh, the first major contributor of the church is the General Council on Finance and Administration. Uh, they give roughly about $400,000 a year to the Oklahoma uh, Indian Missionary Conference. The General Board of Global Ministries gives about $50,000 a year. And the Oklahoma Conference gives a little over $120,000. So it puts us second in terms of giving. Now all of that sounds like a lot, but when you have over, you have between a one or two million dollar budget, you can see where we have the shortfall. We have to really work hard to make our budgets uh, and to, to uh, make sure that our, our ministry stays vibrant. And the money is not going up, it's coming down which is why we create endowments and things of that nature to sustain us in the difficult years that will come, surely. Are you concerned about the future of, of uh, Native American churches in, in Oklahoma? Yes, I am concerned about the future of the Oklahoma uh, Native American churches. One, because I, I perceive that there is this continuation of neglect, of uh, a lack of knowledge, that, that they exist. Um, I, I believe that uh, the future is crucial because the support that we get from the general church is gonna eventually wane and, 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 and go down. I believe that um, more and more people will see or ask about uh, merging the church and things of that nature. But I believe in the future of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. I'm strong on it because uh, in many ways their struggles mirror my struggles because I came out of a past where we were isolated and separated uh, and segregated from the mainstream of the church. And it was a struggle and it always has been. But there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, that says, Though we are poor, we enrich the lives of so many. And though we have nothing, we have everything. That to me speaks about the Native American uh, conference here, is that though we are poor, by the standards of the church, we make others rich. Our differences enrich the church. And though we literally have nothing much, we have everything. And, and what I mean by that is that the spirituality 
of the Native American Conference is such uh, an exhilarating experience. We have church when we have conference. When we gather together as a community of faith, we have three regional sitters that we go to each year, and we have annual conference like our forefathers did back in the 1800s. It's still outside in a tabernacle with open sides. All the music is done in native tongue. And on these center campgrounds, there are little houses surrounding the tabernacle where all the cooking is done. So when we go have an annual conference outside, we provide the meals on the ground, we actually have church. The spirituality is contagious. When you hear the, the hymns of the, of the Creek tribes or the, uh, of the Cherokee tribes or, or the Kiowa tribes, when you hear these hymns rising up in the night, you know, and bouncing off the stars, it has a, it has a tremendous effect upon you. You, you just can't sit there without squirming, without realizing and envisioning how it was 100 years ago or 150 years ago when these people gathered and sang hymns about the trail, when these people sang about the struggles. You know, those are the kinds of things. Though we have nothing, we have everything to offer. And the church could learn something from us because we have something to offer to tell the church is that you don't have to have all these things to be spiritual. You don't have to have the immense things that, 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 that we consider to be riches. You can have literally what you have and enrich the lives of others. And so uh, that's, that's what I believe the future holds for us is that the church will one day come to understand that the Native American community enriches its life and without it they have lost a precious thing. In your opinion, what steps need to be taken to preserve and support the heritage of Native American Methodism in Oklahoma? First of all, I think the steps that, that need to be taken to uh, enhance the, the Native American church and community is that we have to acknowledge their presence. We have to know about them. Not, not just that they're the people over there. In every community just about, in Oklahoma, there are very few of the Oklahoma Conference churches know that there's a Native American church somewhere nearby. Now how can you be so close to a sister or a brother and be so far away? We have to acknowledge their presence in our communities. And not only do we have to acknowledge their presence, but we have to begin the intentional act of reaching out to them. Native American community churches, they don't want to hand out, you know. They, 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 they want to help up. They want to be able to, to work alongside of, not behind, but alongside of our sister and brother churches. I, it, it's, it's amazing to me that we don't know they're there. It's amazing to me that we haven't reached out to them. And it's even more amazing that we haven't incorporated them into our lives. In, into our, I, I guarantee you, if, you if, if some of our churches would invite the Native American community to come over and worship in a way that we do, then spirituality of that church will be in heaven. I mean, it's contagious. It's contagious, and that, that's why I'm so 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 high on it because it's it, it it has changed my life. It has changed my life, and and and, and I cannot uh, believe that I was once. I'm still learning every day, but I cannot believe that one time when I first came here, I was so ignorant of Native American culture and ways. There's hope for people who don't know. Take me, for example, I did not know, but I'm learning every day. And it's just a joy to come into that learning experience, to know that these people were here before we were, that they brought our faith to us. And we need to acknowledge, we need to reach out, and we need to incorporate them into our walk. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Is there any, I wanted to, to ask a couple questions here towards the end about uh, for the general church. Is there anything we've left out on Native Americanism in, in Oklahoma that you'd like to lift up that we haven't uh, talked about? Well, I think one of the questions that I would like to lift up about the Native American uh, uh, Conference and the Oklahoma Conference is that we always get questions about should they merge, should they become one? And, and what would be the advantages of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference merging with Oklahoma? What would we stand to lose or what would we stand to gain? And, and I, think, I think one of the things that I would want to say is that merger would be you know, an acceptable thing, but we would lose a lot. We would lose the distinctive culture and heritage and tradition of Native Americans. You know, they, they bring a unique, a unique perspective of life, of nature, of God, of all these things that, that we cherish and worship, but they bring it from a unique perspective of suffering and trial and difficulties. And when you, when you start looking at it from that perspective, it becomes a brand new picture. Uh, yeah, we could, we could merge, that would, be, that would be an easy thing to do. But I think we would lose a lot of what we don't even know about. And, and, and if we were to, if that was to, to be anything that would be gained by merging, it would be, yes, we would, we would have, uh, the salaries would be increased, you know, we would be able to uh, uh, have more people at the table. But I think that would be pale in comparison to the fact that I think we would have more to lose than gain because I come from an African American experience. I never went to an integrated church when I was a kid. And when, when the African American church merged, we lost something that was unique and distinctive to that community. And in many places, it's dying. I never want to see a Native American context die or fade away. I think it ought to be preserved to the end of time. You know, it's amazing how we can put a plaque on buildings or whatever and memorialize it forever. But here's a living entity of people who have a heritage and a distinction of being indigenous. We found them here. You know, we, 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 we want to do away with what we call Columbus Day. It's, Columbus didn't do anything. Columbus found people here, Native Americans. And they've been here before we were here. We don't, we don't acknowledge that. We don't, we don't treasure that. You know, we don't salute that. We don't, we don't have those kinds of holidays that, that celebrate that. We don't. You know, and, and when I got to Oklahoma, and I have to say this, when I got to Oklahoma, you know, and found out that, you know, um, the mascots was an issue, you know, how we use mascots, you know, it was horrible. It was, I could not believe that we had schools in, in Oklahoma whose mascots were savages. You know, we, we have portrayed and stereotyped Native Americans in such a harmful way. That's what I'm saying. It's still being perpetuated, even to this day. And people have no idea that it's so deeply ingrained in our culture that they have no idea what, we, what we've done. For instance, they, they think the Long Ranger who rode a white horse was all of it. What people would not know is that the Long Ranger actually lived among Native Americans, the real Long Ranger. His name was Bass Reeves. He lived in Muskogee. He was a sheriff. He was the real Long Ranger, but he was taught everything he knew by Native Americans. That would just, I mean, we don't get, that's what I'm talking about, truth and reconciliation. Let's tell the truth, and then we can reconcile. Brother, in the conversation about what trends and initiatives the United Methodist Church give you hope that a church would continue to be effective in its mission in the future? The trends that I think would be helpful for us to, 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 to move us into the future, especially as it relates to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, is to continue uh, this, this dialogue 
of, of, of repentance. If it not repentance, reconciliation. Let, let's just call it what it is and let's continue the dialogue. I, I think that would be a trend. Let's, let's, let's get away from saying, okay, we're going to do it in this four year period of time. And once we do that, we, we've done our part. No, this is the beginning, I think. And I think if the leadership of the church would understand that they could really change the dynamics of a culture and of people by, by moving into the future and using this as, as a foundation for understanding and for dialogue, I think it would be so helpful. I, I, I appreciate what the church has done, but I know that we can do more to continue this conversation with us and the Native American community because for, for over 300 years, there's been no dialogue, there's been no understanding, there's been no admission of anything. And only now in the last 40 years are we coming to a point where we're saying we're sorry. Well, that doesn't quite undo the centuries of neglect and deprivation that we've heaped upon these communities. So I appreciate what the church is doing, but I know as a Methodist all my life, born and reared in a, you're not in a Methodist uh, uh, home and parsonage, I know what we're capable of. And we're capable of doing some great things. I've seen it at work. You perhaps touched on some of this, but uh, what, have, what have you learned about Methodism in Oklahoma that surprised you the most? Some of the things that I've learned about Methodism here in Oklahoma that surprised me is the willingness to be receptive and, 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 and friendly. I, I mean that. I mean, they, Oklahomans are a special breed of people. You know, I, I believe that uh, our history is unique. Our, our, our journey uh, is unlike any, any other because when you look at how we got here and, and, and who was here when we got here and, and how we've had to live together, Oklahomans are, 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 are people who have been through a lot. You know, when you start talking about the dust bowls and all those, we've been through a lot, Oklahomans have. But I believe that by and large, the characteristic that impresses me most about Oklahomans and what has surprised me is their willingness to receive not only strangers, but to, but to accommodate people. And I, that's why I know we have the capacity here in Oklahoma to make our life next to our Native American brothers and sisters work quite well. We, we have that capacity. What I've also learned about the people here in Oklahoma is that uh, out of this context of who they are and what they've become, there is this hope there is this hope that we're going to get to where God wants us to be somehow, some way. And that we've been through a lot, but we are stronger for it and we are, we're, we're better for it. And I believe that, that Oklahoma, uh, I'm going to make it my second home. I, I've got to go back to Texas, but I'm going to have a place in Oklahoma because Oklahoma has a place in my heart as well. And I don't believe that you can come to Oklahoma without it rubbing off on you and, and, and it being a part of your life. Strong statement for protection there. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, looking back on your ministry at the United Methodist Church, what's given you the most satisfaction? The people. The people of the Methodist Church have given me the most satisfaction uh, that I have had. As a bishop, I try to be relational. And consequently, what that means is that I have reached out to the people of Oklahoma as their bishop, and they have embraced me. They have received me. And even though I'm the first African-American bishop to ever serve Oklahoma, color and race have never been a part of my 12-year journey here. Not in one place have I have to ever encounter culture or race. And so uh, the thing that I enjoy most about my time here in Oklahoma has not only been the people, but visiting the churches, being present in the lives of, 
of the congregation and hearing their stories. All the stories of Oklahoma abound. I have heard stories from every, every corner, every, every avenue of culture from Oklahoma, not only Native Americans, but all over Oklahoma. And some of them, I'm gonna write in a book one day because they just, they're just delightful stories of how we got here and the struggles we had to come through to get here. But we're here now, and many consider this to be the promised land. I mean, they, God has brought them to the promised land, but it's been, it's been the people of Oklahoma that have endeared me to this place. Yes. A couple last questions. Sure. Given the opportunity, what would you have done differently in your career, or, or more of, or less of? What I would have done differently, uh, if I had to look back now as bishop in retrospect, what I what I have done differently, I probably would have spent a lot more time fostering the relationship between the Native American churches and the Oklahoma Annual Conference. I say that because I just deeply regret that it took me to 2012 with the act of repentance to begin that. I, I, as a bishop, I knew I had two conferences that I had to relate to, but nothing prohibited me from bringing those conferences closer together. You know, I didn't need permission from an act of repentance to do that. And my word to the next bishop or to anyone who comes to Oklahoma is begin immediately understanding the situation and begin to working on, work on that. You know, if I had to look back on anything that I, I, I wish I could have done differently, I wish I could have hit the ground in 2004 with the end in mind. And the end is making sure that the people of the Oklahoma Conference understand and appreciate the people of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. So much so that we're willing to work together, we're willing to stand side by side, we're willing to bring the life-saving message of Jesus Christ, not only to whites or blacks, but specifically to Native Americans, to Hispanics, to Asians. If we do this together, what would that look like? So that's, that's one of the things that when I look back, I wish I would have done differently. It started in 2004, but there's time. I'm going to make up for it. You're going to be retiring this fall. Yes. And uh, what, what future plans do you have? The future plans that I have for me after retirement uh, is to continue to work in the church. This is my DNA. This is who I am. You know, after 117 years of Methodist ministry in my family, I, I can only uh, think that I'm going to be working in the church somewhere. I, I want to go back to the local church. I have already uh, consented to work. There's a Native American fellowship in Houston, Texas that worships on the third Sunday of every month. I've spoken for them two or three times. I'm going to commit myself to that Native American fellowship to see what we can help it to become. I know that there are a lot of Native Americans in Houston who just don't know that we're there. I want to make it known that we're there. I want to do that. I want to work in the church in a variety of different ways. And that's my future plan, to go back to Houston and, and to work as hard as I can in a local church somewhere, doing exactly what I've done for the last 46 years. Bishop Hayes, thank you.